Next up is our chapter on epidemiology. Really, it's uh, principles of disease and epidemiology. And we're going to take a look at terms first. As usual, pathology is the study of disease. Etiology is the study of the cause of the disease. And pathogenesis is how, you, how the disease develops, so the development of the disease. Infection is the process of invasion or colonization of the body by a pathogen. And disease by definition, abnormal state in which the body is not performing normal function, so we are falling out of homeostasis, if you know what that term means from physiology. Um, as it turns out, our normal microbiota has plays a big role in um, disease progression or in how, do, how we develop disease. So we have this resident population of microorganisms that live on our body and in our body. In fact, it's 10 times more microbial cells that are living in and on our body than we have our own human cells. So the normal microbiota is a very important part of the normal functioning of the body. Um, there are different types of microbiota. Here is one that says transient microbiota. That is only present for a few days, uh, maybe f a few weeks or month, but it's not a permanent uh, microbiota. The normal microbiota, that is the one that's permanent there and um, colonizes us as a host, and, but it does not cause disease. So basically, uh, we have a good relationship with the normal microbiota. We offer them a space to stay and some food. And in return, they're actually doing some very good functions for us. They uh, help us with our immune system. They, um, develop, they will produce certain vitamins like vitamin K and other vitamins that we couldn't produce. So we, ha we have a very good um, mutual um, beneficial relationship and something like that is called a symbiosis. So we are both benefiting. The microbes benefit, we benefit, and everybody's happy. Uh, it wasn't clear for a long time how important this normal microbiota is, and so when antibiotics first came on the market, a lot of people felt like, I, I don't want any microbes on or in my body, so let's just get rid of them altogether, and it ended up causing quite a few problems. And then when people started realizing that, well, we do need this normal microbiota to stay healthy, they started to figure out what is the ideal microbiota, the perfect mix of microbes that you should have in order to stay optimally healthy. And there's something called the Human Microbiome Project that analyzes basically the communities of bacteria that are, I don't know, in your mouth, around every tooth, or uh, on your skin, or in your intestines, or wherever you want to look at. So uh, you can look at these microbiomes, sort of the profile of microorganisms, analyze the profile of microorganisms using the um, uh, genetic analysis and then uh, analyzing the relationship between these microbial communities and your health. So here are some representative normal microbiotas uh, from different regions of the body. Um, the first panel here, there will be bacteria on the surface of the nasal epithelium. So you have a ciliated epithelium right there and you have some coxy looks like there. Then um, in the stomach, the bacteria here, these uh, looks like rods in your stomach, or maybe curvy rods. And then um, here on panel C, we have um, bacteria in the small intestine. So different um, profiles of bacteria that you would find in different places of your body, and they all have a function. Each one of these regions has its own sort of microbiome and a community of bacteria um, with certain profiles. So, since the normal microbiota is so important, we're going to take a look at a further look at this. The distribution and composition of the normal microbiota is determined by many factors. A lot of it has to do what you're feeding them and uh, sort of what ones are favored by the food that you are offering them. And then also physical and chemical factors, host defenses, and then some mechanical factors. So let's take a look at this here. Um, representative normal microbiotas by body region and sort of the um, the main components of each of these um, microbiotas. 
let's just use a few examples. So here on the skin, you are dealing with some propioni bacteria, some staphylococci, uh, even corine bacteria, micrococcus. So you can take a look at this list. And then in the eyes, you have a different uh, mix of bacteria profiles, nose, throat, upper respiratory is yet different. Yeah, let's maybe take a look at your large intestine. There you have a lot of E. coli, um, effusive bacteria, maybe um, enterobacteriaceae of various sorts, but you get the idea. So each place in your body has a different profile of bacteria. Now the question is, what are they doing there and how do, how do we interact with these communities of microorganisms? So for one thing, there is this microbial antagonism. So they are always competing for a spot to live. So you have to think of it as your body being a perfect um, place for these microorganisms to live because you um, offer them a nice environment, some food to eat, and so um, they like it there. And so they want to be there. And if you have positive, good microbacteria, uh, microorganisms, then um, it's a good thing. Um, in fact, a lot of people are taking these probiotics these days to um, have a healthy, normal microbiota, and that's really a good thing. So these microorganisms, they like it um, in your body and, and on your body, and um, they compete with one another for a spot. Um, once they're there and they've settled down so that they established themselves, um, then they are protecting you, the host, by, for example, competing for nutrients. They are also producing substances harmful to invading microbes. Basically, the good ones that are, have settled down there and we have agreed to them being there, um, they uh, don't want to give up their spot. And so they are defending you from a dangerous microbe to picking up that spot uh, in your body by saying, no, I'm, I was here first, and so now you can't be here. So in that way, they're protecting you from an invading microbe. They're also affecting the pH and available oxygen in some cases. So let's take a look at some of the terms that we're using. The term symbiosis is a rather general term, although it's mostly referring to sort of a positive relationship, but it really is any relationship uh, between the, in this case, the normal microbiota and you as the host. Um, there are three versions of this um, living together. Um, that will be commensalism, mutualism and parasitism. Well, let's start maybe with the parasitism. Everybody knows a parasite is not good because a parasite is only out there for their own advantage. And that means that one organism benefits at the expense of the other. So a parasite, a worm, for example, doesn't give anything in return. Um, they're just taking your nutrients, they're taking your space, and they give nothing in return. A mutualism, uh, that's the best way of symbiosis. That means both organisms benefit. That's what you want. So you want a normal, healthy, good microbiota. Then you benefit, the microorganisms benefit, everybody's happy. Commensalism means that one organism benefits and the other one is unaffected. It's not too bad either. But uh, the best thing is, of course, if both sides benefit. Um, some of the normal microbiota are opportunistic pathogens, and um, those are the ones that need to be kept in check. A lot of times it will be a yeast, for example. And so if you kill your normal microbiota with antibiotics, a round of antibiotics, then uh, the yeast was unaffected because it's a eukaryotic cell, and so now they have so much more space. All the other guys are gone, and now yeast will take over, and it becomes an opportunistic pathogen. So it wasn't a pathogen before because it was kept in check by the bacteria that were living in this community too. But now that the bacteria are gone, they got killed, and, and they're gone. Now the yeast has so much more space and it takes over and becomes an opportunistic pathogen. So here, the different types of, of symbiosis. And uh, we said mutualism, that's the best kind because both organisms benefit. Uh, parasitism is bad because only one benefits in the at the cost of the other. Here the example is given uh, some flu virus, H1N1 virus um, infecting a host cell. The host cell does not have any benefit from that. Only the virus gets to multiply inside of the host cell. 
the mutualism example here that's given is E. coli um, in the large intestine, and both both sides will benefit. Commensalism means that uh, one organism benefits and the other one is unaffected. And here we have Staphylococcus epidermidis on the skin. Okay, moving on to Koch's postulates. So this is more now geared toward disease process. So uh, Koch's postulates say that the same pathogen must be present in every case of the disease. So and basically Koch established that a certain pathogen causes a certain disease. So this pathogen disease connection, it might seem intuitive to you, but it wasn't at all clear for the longest time. And Koch established that Yes, the same pathogen causes the same disease. In order to establish this disease pathogen connection, you must be able to isolate the pathogen from a dead host and then grow it in pure culture. So you must be able to grow this pathogen in culture. And then once you take this pathogen from the pure culture and inject it into a, a healthy, like a lab animal, usually to use mice or rats for that, then the pathogen... Uh, must be causing the same disease that it previously caused in the in the animal that it was isolated from. So basically, you must be able to carry the pathogen from one host to the next, and it causes the same disease every time. So then you can basically prove that this pathogen causes this particular disease. So here's an example given. Um, Here's a microorganism and it has killed this animal right here. So now from this mouse here, you are isolating a pathogen. You're growing colonies of bacteria right here. Then you're taking these, a colony of bacteria injected into a healthy mouse and oh, poor mouse died. Then you're isolating the bacteria again. Look at it and under the microscope you see that these were the same ones that killed the first mouse. So then you establish that these bacteria are causing the mouse to die every time. Cross postulates are used to prove that the cause the cause of infectious disease, and so um, basically it's the disease pathogen connection. Exceptions to Koch's postulates include some pathogens can cause several disease conditions of so various forms, like what we see right now with the COVID-19. Uh, some people get very sick, some people even die, and other people have only mild symptoms, or maybe some have no symptoms at all. So certain pathogens, they can cause different versions of a disease. Some pathogens, they can only cause disease in humans. A good example for that would be, let's say you get the flu. Uh, your dog is not going to get the flu from you because that um, virus will only infect humans. Some viruses can jump species barriers, but the rule is more likely than not is that if it's if a, a pathogen causes disease in one species, it's typically um, not causing the same disease in another species. Now with the COVID-19, there's um, coronavirus is actually pretty notorious for jumping species barriers, but that's not normal. And lastly, um, also some microbes, they just cannot be cultured and therefore you cannot apply Cox postulates. Let's move on to some terms that you would need to know um, when you're classifying infectious diseases. People talk about symptoms, signs, syndromes. Let's see what the difference is. A, symptoms is a, a symptom is a change in body function that is felt by the patient as a result of disease. Uh, good examples would be sneezing, uh, itchy, watery eyes, um, nausea, and diarrhea. Those are symptoms. Signs are changes in a body that can be measured or observed as a result of disease. Um, that would be a good example would be fever. A syndrome is a collection of symptoms, so it's more than one symptom uh, that's surrounding the disease. So when we when we talk about HIV causing AIDS, that's the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. That means um, people with AIDS, they have a collection of symptoms, more than one symptom. More terms here. Communicable disease is a disease that is spread from one host to another. A good example, COVID-19. Uh, contagious diseases, those are diseases that are easily and rapidly spread from one host to another. Again, COVID-19 is a great example for that. 
We also have non-communicable infectious diseases. Those are diseases that are not spread from one host to another directly. An uh, example for that would be something like West Nile virus um, because you only get it from a mosquito that's um, sucking some blood and transmitting the virus there. But you cannot um, spread West Nile virus directly from one host to another, from one human to another human. And here... Two more terms here. Incidence is the number of people who develop a disease during a particular time period. And prevalence is the number of people who develop a disease at a specified time, regardless of when it first appeared. We're going to continue this on the next.